Hi, I'm Matty Hayden. Tonight on Cricket Legends, Crash catches up with one of the all-time great batsmen to play the game. He was born in Trinidad as the 10th child of 11 and grew up to become a batting machine. He played 131 tests, amassed over 11,000 runs and an average of 52.88. He holds a record for a first class innings of 501 not out for Warwickshire in 1994. In 2004, he broke my record for a highest score in a test innings, scoring 400 not out against England. His nickname is The Prince. He is Brian Charles Lara and he is a cricket legend. Well, welcome, Brian. Nice to see you. Thank you. Uh, what does your year involve these days? Well, um, since I retired, I you know, became the ambassador for sports and tourism in Trinidad and Tobago. So it entails a lot of traveling still and um, trying to encourage people to come to Trinidad and Tobago. We have a great island. Uh, plus, I have little small businesses that I'm involved with. And um, so it's a lot of traveling, which I, I love. I, I liked it when I was playing. I still do a lot of it. and. Um, Generally, that's it. You know, a lot of golf as well. What's it like for you moving around Trinidad? Do you get mobbed or do they just say, nah, that's Brian? From um, uh, an early age, I was recognised as someone who had the potential to play international cricket, to play and represent the West Indies. So coming from a very small population, 1.3 million people, yes, you have the ones that get excited in different parts of the country if I, I go to those parts. But um, generally in the, in the city, People are accustomed, you know, you're going to get a second glance, but I think um, people are quite happy with who I am, the likes of Arthur Bolden, Dwight York. Um, we have a few people that, you know, have made the country proud, and uh, I think they give us our space. Brian, I guess one thing missing from your career was the career-ending autobiography, your whole life story. You never wrote one, and you're just about the only big-time cricketer who hasn't. Is there any reason for that at all? Um, it's just to find the right person to do it. And I believe that um, my story is, you know, I, what I see in the books that are being written, it's a lot to do about cricket. And I'd really like to tell a life story and uh, try to have people understand life of a Caribbean man. You know, yes, you're in a sporting arena and you've done um, your country proud and you've had a, a, a long, successful career. But really and truly, to me, the interesting story is you know, what happened in the back streets of Santa Cruz at school, different things that could, could give people an idea of what made me into the person that I am today. And I think the runs and the, and the innings, I think people have a fair understanding of that. And describing that, yes. But, you know, the life beyond the boundary and, and getting people to understand the, the different uh, influences I had in my life, the negatives, the positives, and that's the story I really want to give, and I want to find the right person to do that. When you cracked the big time, you said that American kids are sort of groomed for fame. Whereas you said when you're a small kid from a tiny village in the Caribbean, it's so much harder. Is that true? It's very, very tough. And I've had a pretty tough time in trial and error um, from 1994 when I first broke that record. But the only experience and lesson that I had was in 1976 when we won our first gold medal in 100 meters, Hazley Crawford. And my dad took the entire family and I think the whole of Trinidad and Tobago went to the airport to receive Hazley Crawford as he came back on the plane. And I remember just, just, you know, being engulfed with the whole atmosphere. And I didn't say that I wanted the exact thing to happen to me, which it did, something like, I mean, 18 years later. But fame and that sort of international recognition is something that you don't dream as a little boy in, in the Caribbean. You, you want to play for West Indies, you want to do certain things, but you know, you never really know it's going to be at that level. And, um, you know, in, as you said, in America, you look at the Tiger Woods story, you can, he's on video from the age of four or five, you know. I don't think we had that in the crew. Let's go back to the start of your story. You're one of 11 children. It, it's just amazing, isn't it? You don't see it much these days. What was life like as one of 11? Number 10 of 11, which means uh, we had our own cricket team. And being one of the younger ones, I had to bat at number 10, even though I had four sisters. <laughs> but it's, it's great to have uh, such a family. Um, might have been a three-bedroom house, and uh, you had a big sister who wanted one of the bedrooms for, the, for herself and my parents, so the rest of us were um, pushed into the back room. But it was, it was awesome, and I believe it played a very 
important role in, in my life and in my character. Just say, for instance, on the cricket field, you know, just getting a, a knock in the streets with my brothers and their bigger friends. It was always going to be tough for me. And I think that gave me a lot of, um, a lot of strength and character and developed a lot of areas that maybe you know, I would not if I was just playing in my, my age group. The death of your father, just as you were breaking into the international scene, he never saw you play a test. You said that was one of the, the great regrets, that he didn't live long enough to see you play international cricket. Yeah, I mean, this man had 11 kids, and um, he dedicated um, his life to all of them. And um, being number 10 with a, a sister after me, um, I could feel that he really and truly gave his all. And knowing the fact that I had a, cricket, a bit of cricket and ability, he was always there. He took me to, to coaching, he took me to school cricket games. And to get as far as that point, I remember on the Tuesday, I'm not sure if it was Tuesday, but he called me and he said, did you hear the team? I said, no, he said, you're on the team. And uh, a couple of days of practice at the Queen's Park Oval, the 11 was announced, I was not in the 11, and um, you know, he asked me for some tickets for the second and the third day of the weekend, and I got it from Clive Lloyd, the manager at the time, and uh, to get a phone call early in the morning that he passed away was a very sad occasion for me. And it's, if, it's, if it's something I could, could happen differently in my career, I would like him to have seen me play for the West Indies cricket team. The innings that really changed your life was your world record test best at the time of 375 against England in Antigua. It just seemed to, you, you can almost draw a line there from Brian Lara's life before it to after it, can't you? Yeah, you could. I remember um, having a shower in the bathroom here in Sydney and Sir Garfield so was coming to the, to the bathroom. He wanted to congratulate me on my 277. He said, you know, young man, what have you done? He said, you know, what are you doing getting a run out? You know, 365 is just around the corner. But to be honest, I never f felt that, you know, that I could score that amount of runs. So 277 for me was a great achievement. To, and, and to do it in your first ever test century was, was something very special to me. But I think that gave me the understanding that I could go on to bigger things. And, um, you know, 14 months later, Antigua, and Sir Garfield Sobers was there as, as well. It was a very special moment for me, but as you said, life was totally different after that. It, it was extraordinary, wasn't it? Him being there and the game stopped as he walked out to greet you. Like, it was just almost too much, wasn't it? It was unbelievable. I think Barbados was uh, doing some tourism uh, functions throughout the, the Caribbean uh, associated with the series against England. And uh, he was not just at that particular match, he was at all of them. So um, it was... It was we have a very close relationship, um, Sir Garfield and myself, and, and something that is maybe even stronger than players that I've played with or even guys that are close proximity of my career. I mean, I did not see him bat, but the relationship grew from the time I started playing school, school cricket. In the replay of your pull shot for the record and your pad brushed the stumps and the bale came out and sat on the edge of the stumps. That is just <laughs> incredible, isn't it? Today I wish it fell off. <laughs> <laughs> a less stressful <laughs> life? <laughs> I heard about it. I, I, I looked and looked and looked. And yes, the bale was uh, at the top of the stump. But I don't think you can tell me if it was there before or after. But um, it's something that maybe destiny had to happen. Brian, a few weeks after that, you made 501, the world record first class score for Warwickshire. And, and, and a question I guess every cricketer would like to ask, fitness and concentration. Where do you get it from for that sort of innings? Uh, first of all, it's passion and love to bat. And that is key, uh, a, a commitment to want to bat. Understanding the game is also very important. Knowing that, you know, a lot of guys set a, a mark of 100 or, you know, if I get 100, I'm happy. And you could tell that, you know, all of a sudden they seem to be in trouble. They lost focus. And uh, from a very early age, Maybe on, because of pressure at school level, I had to bat most of the overs. So you, want, you, know, you were scoring more than 50% of the team runs all the time. And that, that love for batting and dedication developed and developed. And I'd walk into bat in a test match at 2 for 20 at 11 a.m. in the morning. And I know that my captain is not going to declare until you know, the fifth session is over and you know, close to the end of the second day. And I set my stalls out to bat that period of time, session by session by session. So 100 or 50 
a 150 never really meant as much as it did maybe for other people. And um, I think that's just an understanding of the game and not having any personal goals or things achieved. We're going to score 550, we're going to score 600. I'm going to be here for majority of it. When former West Indian coach Bennett King returned home, someone said to him, tell us something about Brian Lara we don't know. And he said he does very well in the beep tests, which surprised a lot of people because we never really thought of you as being a, a gym junkie or a fitness freak. But so where did it come from? I think um, you have to be fit. I mean, a lot of people did not associate fitness with myself. They felt that, you know, that's the natural abilities there. Um, he breaks curfews, he does this, he does that. But you can't do all those things and be successful. After your 501, you became probably cricket's biggest superstar at that time, and you were deluged with sponsorship offers and responsibilities. And one of your quotes was that cricket was ruining your life. It, it all became too much. Tell us about that period of your life. It was very, very tough. And um, I think it, it came over like a, a 18 month period. And that statement uh, took place in England in 1995, which was really a year after the records. And we were touring England with the West Indies cricket team. And in-house um, stuff that, you know, we don't need to go into here, plus all the personal pressure. Um, again, it boils back to the point of, you know, am I being well managed? Was I prepared for such an occasion? And um, I was not. You know, and uh, as you say, maybe cricket, uh, biggest star at the time and you know people had different interests in me the managers would, would want to know what they can get out of this I'm trying to play my cricket of course you want to be financially secure and um, I just think it's a watershed moment in cricket not just in my life and an opportunity for people now to take it another level and you had the Sachin Tendulkar's and these guys um, came after Shane Warne developed into a huge star and maybe better managed um, but again it's not something that I would ever give away. You know, I enjoyed every minute of it and it was good. Was there ever any time when you felt close to a breakdown or just sort of thought, I just can't do this anymore? Uh, yeah, there were occasions where I felt that I needed to step back. And um, there were a couple of tours that I couldn't really go on. I didn't feel in the frame of mind to, to play cricket. And your preparation for a big day was occasionally unusual. In your 375, before you got it, you played golf in the morning. That, that, that's amazing. It wouldn't happen today, would it? Well, you got to understand that I could not sleep. The minute I got back to the hotel, I had dinner uh, after the second day, and I watched movies right through the night. So 5, 5 a.m. in the morning, I'm starting to feel sleepy. I've got a bus to catch in a couple hours' time, and I called a friend, and I said, you know, I need to, I need to get out. And we went to play some golf, and really that was just to get my mind off of the cricket, get myself prepared, and to to refocus myself. Teammates said they rarely saw you nervous, but one moment was before you met Nelson Mandela. They said you were pacing around and you were just like, uh, you were so excited. But that was obviously a great moment in your uh, life. Great moment. 1993 was the first time, you know, I met him, and we met him as a team in Johannesburg. We were playing a triangular series with South Africa and Pakistan. That was an awesome occasion, and uh, I was ha I had the opportunity of meeting him a couple more times and actually having a session with him, an hour session at his house, which was awesome back in, I think this was about 2006. What I, I got it from him is, is his way of, of doing things and what he did exactly when he left uh, the prison and his, the way he gave, forgave all South Africans, anybody that was you know, negative towards him. And um, you know, that's one thing I wanted to ask him. And he said, he said to me, Brian, you know, it's, it's a situation where he was working towards achieving something for his people. And if he did not react in that way, and if it, he was, say, you know, come on, let's, you know, destroy, you know, the people that uh, had us in apartheid, it was not going to be the right thing. And I think that, I think that is definitely the essence of the man, and something that stuck with me: the way he's just willing to walk away and develop South Africa as a whole. And you gave him one of your bats when you signed it. You said, 
I love you, President Mandela. And I thought it's a very simple statement, but a really strong one. Well, I mean, it's, he's, he's been a hero to everyone in the Caribbean. Um, all, I mean, all people around the world that believe in his, in his fight. And um, to meet him, you know, you never really expect that occasion to happen. And I did not live or understand what was taking place in the 60s and the 70s, but getting to understanding later on in my career and being and having that privilege to meet him, you know, it's, it, it, you develop an understanding, you have the opportunity to meet him, and then he's, you just connect with him, and, you know, he's going to be a part of, of me for the rest of my life. You had some epic battles with Australia, didn't you? And you scored nine centuries against him, an average 50, which was outstanding. And quite often you would win the battle, but occasionally lose the war, weren't you? What did you make of the whole UV Australia? Well, it was definitely, for me, the cricket that I wanted to play the most. Playing against the best team in the world at the time. I think from the mid-90s and for the remainder of my career, Australia was the number one team. And to come up against the likes of the War Brothers and, and Shane and uh, Glenn McGrath was always something very special for me. Um, we always were second favourites, you know, at no point in time from the 1995 loss in the Caribbean, we were expected to beat Australia. And maybe that gave me the impetus, you know, that, that what I needed as a competitor to go out and perform. And um, it was great battles, lost most of them, but um, I think I gave my best always against Australia. The Australian players always felt that you were one of the great gap finders uh, in, in world cricket. And you even called one of your books Beating the Field. And a couple of them actually went back through this book to see what, what they could learn from your little coaching methods. And one thing they found was when you were young, you had pot plants placed on a balcony and you didn't try to hit them, but you tried to hit the ball between them. <laughs> and they felt, did that play a role in your gap finding ability? Um, most definitely. I mean, as a youngster, I played a lot of cricket matches. So I would be in my garage, I'd be tossing the ball, maybe train it against the wall and I'd have, you know, the 11 fielders there. And I would fit myself in the batting order. So it would be Fredericks, Greenwich, Richards, Lara, even though I was only seven or eight years old. And then you get on to Larry Gomes and, and Clive Lloyd and these guys. And um, I played for a lot of runs, you know. So it was just not important just to just hit the ball and pick it up. You know, I would make the runs. I'll go and score it as well. So I think finding the gaps is, is important. It's a part of cricket. And if you're an entertainer, you want to score runs. You want to keep the, the scoreboard ticking. You want to have the crowd involved in the game and I found that I had that understanding of where everybody was in the field I would look around and I would know you know where backward point or where backward square leg is doesn't matter who is bowling if it's Shane or Flintoff or McGrath and I would know exactly where I'd want to place the ball it's not going to happen all the time to get runs you know you get a bat ball you want to put it away for runs. And Adam Gilchrist said recently that when he was captaining against you Occasionally, he'd move a fieldsman, say, from mid-wicket to backward point, and he'd hear you say, bad move. And, <laughs> <laughs> and yeah. your little comment on it. And uh, he, said, he said it just really got to him. And later, you explained it. What was your thinking? No, I think that, um, again, with that knowledge of where you can score, and sometimes, you know, they would block an area and they would be bowling a, a particular line, and you, you, you would have to throttle back and say, well, OK, I have to wait. And... and try to score somewhere else. So whenever he opened up a gap or believed that he was closing another gap, you know, I, it was just fun. It was just banter. I most likely was on a lot of runs <laughs> at the same time. I wouldn't say that if I was in five or 10, but sometimes when you get out there and you're in full control of your innings and your batting, you, you're capable of doing most things that you want. The West Indies held you back a long time. There were 16 months between your first and second tests. You were 12th man for an entire series against Australia. How frustrated were you and, and how do you look back at that time now? Well, I might have been frustrated maybe because of um, immaturity, but I believe it was a significant part of my career. The Western team was a very successful team, you know, and uh, I played my first test match because of the absence of Sir Vivian Richards. Uh, he came back, so definitely he was back in the, in the team and I had to look for somebody else's spot. They had the likes of Gus Logie and Carl Hooper, you know, Rich Richardson was still around, Gordon and, and Desmond, and it was always going to be tough. But today, I'm very appreciative. And I tell Sir Viv all the time when I see him, thank you for holding me back, because I don't believe that I was actually ready to perform. I might have like, moved into good performances, but I remember even being in England in 1990 for that uh, tour. And 
averaging 28 in all the practice games. It was just totally different conditions. And just getting that apprenticeship period over was, I think, key for immediate success. You'll always be remembered so fondly in Australia for your 277 at the Sydney Cricket Ground, which you said for so many years was your best innings. Do you still rate it, your best innings? Oh, uh, it's definitely up there. Um, I played another innings against Australia in uh, Jamaica, and I know the West End rates the 153 not out in Barbados, which happened a week later. But for me, in terms of uh, showing character and strength, I was under a lot of pressure in Jamaica in the second test match. We lost the first in Trinidad, which was our sixth defeat after losing five in South Africa. And uh, to come out there with a the double century, uh, I think that is definitely the one that I hold up in the air. Absolutely. And you called your daughter Sydney after the Sydney test. Where is Sydney now? She's 18. I uh, just left her a couple of days ago playing volleyball for her school against Ecuador, which is which was awesome to see. The exact day I was leaving, and I took my um, second daughter, Tyler, with me. So I shared a little bit of uh, time with her, but she's still at school and uh, working really hard, and she's planning to take a gap year, and if she does, I'm planning to take her to Sydney. The West Indies were unbeaten between 1980 and 1995. Extraordinary run, 15 years, and have not really been able to, to, to match that force in any way since. What went wrong, Brian? Uh, infrastructure, administration in terms of our cricket. I don't think they did anything to, to get us to, to get our young players to another level. They felt that, okay, we had uh, Sagafi Silvers, we want to go back to the three Ws. We had uh, Viv Richards, uh, Gordon Greenwich, Desmond Haynes, everybody that I think developed their talent on their own. Other countries were able to develop their cricketer. We were still thinking that the next Phil Richards or the next Brown Lara is going to come out from nowhere. And that, it happened because I still believe that we have the best young cricketers in the world. But you need to harness that talent, especially in today's cricket where, you know, the Australians would turn on a video and they would see every fold that I have or every fold that, just say for instance, a present day cricketer like Darren Bravo has. And he had to develop some sort of mechanism to fight that. And we don't help our cricketers in that way. Do you fear for the future of West Indies cricket? I fear big time. And uh, I mean, it's, it's been a downward spiral for quite some time. And uh, unless we have some new astute thinkers and people who can bring the game to a different level, maybe take a different part, I think we're just going to be struggling in, in the quagmire that we are in. We have fights off the field between board and players. Our cricket is struggling on the field. I mean, nothing seems to be going right. So you have to have some sort of refresh uh, look at things and, and come back with a different plan. Brian, they say one of the great contests in county cricket was Lara V. Ambrose on an English morning when he just went at you. Can you remember that morning? Yeah, I, I did. And um, it's a very peculiar day because he, he hit me in the head very early. And I remember that over the, it was the first ball of the over. And the next five balls, he pitched it up and I, I you know, poked around and got off the strike. And um, I lasted till lunch. And my dressing room when I got in was very quiet. And I just wondered, what was the problem? And you know, one guy stood up and said, you know, if that was me batting out there, after that first ball hit me in my head, he's going to give me five more. <laughs> <laughs> so they were actually upset that Ambrose did not bowl me five more bounces. <laughs> but um, we had some great battles. Um, very lucky to be on the same team with him on the international scene because I heard he was a very special bowler. You saw all those great West Indian quicks. Who was the, who was the number one? Who was, if I said to you, right, we're picking a team here now, and you said, all right, I've got to lead my attack, which one? Malcolm Marshall. Why, why is that? He was just uh, the best bowler, and I, I believe that I read bowlers on batsmen being in the best of form, which bowler could topple them over. Malcolm Marshall would be my West Indian bowler that can do that, and Waza Markham would be the bowler around the world that I believe as a batsman, when I walked out to bat, if I was in the best of form, I still had to be very careful around him. Spin bowlers never really bothered you, and the Australians often felt that you played, particularly Stuart McGill on a break, you just knew er everything he was doing. Did you feel that level of comfort? Yes, and uh, I think that started um, or stemmed from the fact that I grew up in Trinidad and Tobago. And most of the islands on the southern part of the Caribbean, uh, the indentured labourers from India, came so Guyana, Trinidad and Tobago and we I think our population is maybe split, you know, where we have, you know, fifty fifty in terms of Indians and Africans and a lot of spin. 
Uh, so I played a lot of spin at, at school cricket. And you, you, you look at Chandra Paul, it's very similar. The pitches are more conducive to, to spin bowling. And I think I created a, a, I developed a loving for it. So uh, the likes of Shane and, and Murali, I ad adapted to their spin and their potency very quickly. And it was easier for me to play them. Glenn McGrath got you out most times in international cricket. W was he the toughest bowler to face? He was tough in terms of um, his ability to be patient. Um, as an attacking player, the last person you want to face is someone who's just going to be hit one line, one length, every single ball. You actually want somebody to attack you. You want somebody to come after you, or, or Brett Lee, or, or anyone like that. But McGrath was very, very patient, and that made it tough for me. You know, someone who wanted to dominate the bowler, uh, I couldn't do that. So I learned very quickly. I mean, he got me out most of the times, but I learned very quickly that I, I, I needed to score at the other end. And uh, McGrath was someone that's not going to give you anything. And if you want to last out there, you, you can't just try to counterattack. And I give him great uh, credit for his career. He's a tremendous bowler, not just uh, someone like me. You look like the Sachin Tendulkar and all the top batsmen around the, the world he traveled. And um, he was also very special. I think a huge part in Australia's dominance over in the late 90s and early 21st century. And meeting President Obama, there aren't too many cricketers that have done that. Y your, your memory from that? Uh, it's an awesome experience. Um, you know, Chogam uh, was going on in Trinidad, and uh, he visited us. And yeah, it was just a very special occasion to have my daughter as well with me and um, trying to teach him to bat. You know, you look at the screen now, you think, well, you know, he looks all right. But his, <laughs> po his first uh, pose was like, you know, a baseball bat. So I had to get the bat down. I had to get his foot moving to, to the line. And um, it was just something that you'd always remember. So many great memories, Brian, and uh, we're thrilled to have you with us today. You're a legend of the game. Thanks for joining us. Thank you very much.